hello everyone i hope i am audible and uh, let's begin our class today it's really nice to be back after this long gap of our pandemic and let's start uh, today we shall begin with one very interesting issue which is the nonsense literature all right and uh, primarily we will be talking about shukumar rai and his abul tabul his nonsense rhymes now if you look at your syllabus then you have the prescribed text by satyajit ray however first let us understand what is nonsense literature and then we shall try to talk about uh, its other issues and all now why did i choose nonsense rhymes first because you see we think of nonsense in very linear terms we think of nonsense in very simplistic and rather over simplistic terms and therefore it is paramount that we try to understand nonsense in a very new light in a very theoretical light that is what is nonsense now several people have looked at nonsense from several the perspectives for instance g k chesterton writes mankind is the uh, mankind in the main has always regarded reason as a bit of a joke so chesterton looks at reason as a, a joke therefore he suggests that nonsense uh, if we try to analyze this statement we come to realize two things issue number 1 is that gk uh, chesterton is looking at nonsense in a binary light with sense he is pitching nonsense against sense against reason and secondly he is looking at reason as a joke so keep these two things in mind and we shall come back to them secondly t s eliot suggests that nonsense is not a vacuity of sense it is a parody of sense and that is the sense of it so nonsense does not imply a vacuity of sense that is it is not a vacuum of sense nonsense does not stem <coughs> from a vacuum of sense or from a vacuity of sense but rather it parodies sense it is a game play on sense as the germans call it a spiel s p i e l a spiel is a psychological gameplay so a nonsense is like a psychological gameplay on sense <laughs> it is a parody of sense so it is a pastiche in a very postmodern term pastiche means to playing off whatever was considered to be very serious you play it off and it is this pastiche it is the sense of parody that is the sense of nonsense now let us try to uh analyze these statements because you see we will need some form of parameter on which we can develop our argument so what shall be the parameters now i have chosen gk chesterton and ts eliot you can choose anybody else there is no one way of looking at nonsense literature and no one way is the only correct way of looking at nonsense literature and therefore you can look at it in any way that you choose all right so let's now focus a bit on what we have uh, gathered till now and let's develop on it so nonsense in its general parlance is seen over here as a corollary to sense and as an antithesis to sense so it is both a corollary and an antithesis it is pitched against sense it is pitched against reason in its most general understanding of the term now if we focus on this aspect then what is reason now if you look at, at the western philosophers one major philosopher first talks about sense one major philosopher first talks about reason and rationality and his name is rene descartes all right 
Now, Rene Descartes suggests that dubito ergo cogito, cogito ergo sum. I doubt, therefore I think, I think, therefore I am. Now, let us skip for the time being the first part of his argument, that is dubito ergo cogito, that is I doubt, therefore I think. But look, in the second part, Descartes says that cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Therefore, it is our rationality which kind of constructs our being, which kind of constructs our reason, our understanding, our existence, according to Descartes. Now, if we focus on this statement, what Descartes suggests, then we come to a greater understanding. That is, for Descartes, he says, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I... Now, look at this, therefore. This, therefore, is the hinge between the two arguments, I think and I am. So my existence and my capacity, my cognitive capacity of thinking, these two are hinged by that therefore. All right. And look, on the other hand, G.K. Chesterton suggests that mankind in the main has always regarded reason as a bit of a joke. So basically mankind, if we pitch this against Descartes, then we re realize that mankind's existence is often considered as a joke. Now, what is a joke? Because nonsense, look, I'm not deviating. I'm basically trying to expand your view. I'm trying to expand the area of our argument. Basically, what happens uh, is that we think of nonsense literature in the parlance of jokes, in the parlance of laughter. And what are jokes good for if they do not make us laugh, right? So, you see, why does a joke make us laugh? Now, let me ask this question. Why does a joke make me laugh? The simple answer would be uh, that a joke makes me laugh because whatever I intended to say and whatever was communicated, so between my intention and my communication, there is a gap, a shadow falls in that gap. And in, in that gap, between my intention and my communication, evokes the laughter. That is, the gap is so very ridiculous, it is so very ludicrous that it evokes the laughter. Right? Now, it is in this gap that the vast chasm, between sense and nonsense resides, if I put it like this. For instance, Sigmund Freud, uh, in his essay on jokes and their meaning, Freud suggests something very interesting. That is, he gives us an example of a joke. What is that example? Now, Freud suggests that the Queen of England, she has gone to a dementia hospital. And in that hospital, the Queen has asked uh, the queen has bumped into a patient. The patient deliberately bumped into the queen. And do you know who I am? And the patient looked at her and he simply said, No, ma'am, but if you go to uh, the front desk, they will definitely tell you. So look, the queen got offended and she said, Do you know who I am? That is, she was questioning that don't you know I am the queen, that is my status, that is my social standing. But this man, he is a dementia patient and he knows that his fellow inmates are also dementia patients and it is very common to forget who you are when you have dementia. So therefore he says, no ma'am, but if you go to the front desk, they will definitely tell you. So look, between what the queen wanted to convey and what got conveyed besides the laughter and that is the fun and freedom of jokes. All right. So nonsense literature consciously and constantly challenges our existing parameters, our accepted parameters of our own logic, of our own cognitive faculties, of our own previous understanding of our existence, of our reason, of our rationality. Now look, on the other hand, T.S. Eliot suggests that it is a parody of sense. Now, why does Eliot call this a parody?
parody of sense. What does he mean by this? A parody is something, it is a form which follows the main work. Say if you make a parody of a text, if you make a parody of a film, for instance, uh, there was this uh, pop cult movie, since this is popular literature, therefore I am using that uh, pop cult movie, uh, which is Twilight Saga. I did not like the movie, but in any way. Now, uh, Twilight Saga has a spoof, a parody called Vampire Suck. If you watch that movie, and it's hilarious, it's ridiculous. So, why, what does Vampire Suck do to uh, the Twilight Saga? It basically subverts the expressions, the expectations that we have from the text. All right. So, and in this subversion resides the fun of the text, resides the joy of exploring the text in a very new light. All right. So parody enacts a subversion. It is a carnivalist celebration of life. It is a carnivalist celebration of disorder. Now, carnivalist is a concept by Mikhail Bakhtin, who was a Russian formalist. Let me make it a bit simpler for you. For instance, say you have gone to Nico Park. All right. And there is a ride called bumping cars. <clears throat> now imagine two, two of your friends are there and you have gone on that ride and uh, you are bumping into each other's cars and you are having a gala time. Now let's fast forward to 10 years. You and your two friends are still in touch. You are successful in life and you have bought, say somebody has bought a Bentley, somebody has bought a Mercedes, Somebody has bought maybe say a uh, Land Rover or something like that. And you are on the street. And so one of you decides, all right, let's have some fun. So 10 years ago, we had a bumping car ride in Nico Park. So now let's reenact that situation on the street. That is, we bump into each other's cars. And now you realize that that won't be funny anymore. Because here, if you bump into each other's cars, that causes a lot of damage, that causes a lot of hardships and so on and so forth, and you are breaking the law. So basically what happens over here is that you are not following the protocol of society. But in Nico Park, if you did not bump into anybody else's car, then you are not following the protocol of that carnival, that uh, fantasy land. So what happens differently over here? That remains the question. Learn to ask that question first. Basically, in Nico Park, you are celebrating a form of disorder. You are celebrating a form of different order than the general order that we follow in society. All right. So in Nico Park, what happens is that we are having a different sets of rules which do not apply to the normal present day society. But in the present day society, we have also rules that do not apply in Nico Park. So that the Nico Park or any amusement park for that matter plays by a different sets of rules which subvert the rules that apply in the society in general. Alright, that is in Nico Park, you can have fun by bumping into each other's cars, but in real life society, you can't. All right. So basically, this is a very interesting concept of the carnival. If we go back to the medieval ages, where from where Bakhtin uh, kind of develops his theory, then you will see that the church had a very firm grip on your lives. Whatever you do, starting from, uh, say, whoever you are going to date to whatever food will be cooked in your family uh, and so on and so forth. Everything was to a great degree determined by the church itself. 
Now, when everything was determined by the church, you can realize that the church governed your lives. But during the festival of the Sonalia, which is now celebrated during the Christmas, there were carnivals. Now, in carnivals, the societal rules were subverted. How? For instance, say a pope enters the carnival and the boy dressed, uh, say, not the pope, the bishop enters the carnival. And a boy who is dressed like the bishop, he also enters with the bishop's retinue. And he is called the boy bishop. There were feasts. The feast, uh, there were two kinds of feasts. One was the feast of the fools. And another was the feast of the asses. And whoever could be the most unruly was given a title. He was the king of the carnival. He was called the lord of misrule. You see, these things are very interesting because they give a kind of vent to the repressed existence that we have in society. Always understand that this is not me saying, this is Freud saying. Man feels constricted by the very society, by the very rules, by the very norms that he creates. And therefore, we need some form of quote-unquote nonsense to give vent to the sense in us and therefore nonsense being the parody of the norm of sense is very important now you can ask me that sir the nonsense verges on fantasy as well because if you have read alice in wonderland or through the looking glass then you can think that it verges on uh, fantasy as well although i am not dealing with those texts this year but then still, when I'm talking about the genre, they, that text will also come. Now, you see, fantasy is a bit different from nonsense. How? Fantasy is governed by the logic of the improbable. All right. Fantasy is governed by the logic of the improbable. That is what that is not impossible. That is improbable. That does not usually happen. And fantasy is governed by the logic of the improbable. For instance, say, uh, imagine, all right, that uh, I have gone on an evening walk. I have gone on an evening walk. And there, under some old banyan tree, I have met a very beautiful looking ghost. I do not know that that entity is a ghost but i have fallen in love now i marry that ghost i date that ghost whatever whatever and later i come to know that that entity was not a human being a living breathing human being but a ghost all right now that would be a thing of fantasy because it is governed by the logic of improbable all right now once we accept the improbable as a norm once we are comfortable with the improbable as a norm, what Coldrich calls the suspension of disbelief, is when we suspend our disbelief, then we realize that uh, the things follow through and fall in place. All right. But nonsense does not simply uh, deal with the logic of the improbable. Rather, nonsense uh, kind of twitches the periphery of the sense. It is to a certain extent, I would not call it a proper transgression of sense, but I would call it, it is an extension of sense. And therefore, it extends, it expands, it explodes the periphery of the sense and uh, deals with the probable and hence uh, and hence it is a continuous constant and conscious reconstruction of the society or the order as we understand it for instance let's imagine say this part this part in between my hands this is the domain of the sense all right this is the periphery of sense so this is more or less a straight line. So what would nonsense do? 
nonsense would stretch this domain like this so that this part this is still sense but then it is an extended variation of sense rather than an absolute breakaway with sense and absolute transgression of sense so nonsense offers a critique of the order nonsense offers a critique of society nonsense offers a kind of reconstruction a conscious reconstruction of society itself all right now let us try to understand what do we mean by general nonsense and theoretical nonsense that is non hyphenated sense and non hyphenated nonsense one word one is non hyphenated sense and the other is nonsense one singular word now we must realize that there are two layers of understanding nonsense as i have always uh, tried to explore one layer is simply the carnivalist layer which is the subversion of the norms but on the other hand nonsense also functions in a very hyper realistic way how basically what happens with nonsense what is hyper reality for instance say uh, today two football teams are having a match at say maybe brazil all right and you are sitting in kolkata now they are showing it live for instance say i am sitting here in bilburia and some of you are in bajbot somebody is maybe in kullani somebody is maybe in um say assam or any place else wherever you are but we are all sharing the same live stream as we are watching this video we are interacting simultaneously so what i am saying over here is reaching to you in an instant due to the internet similarly uh so there is a football match between two teams one is your favorite and the other is maybe say another now in that football match it is happening in say the standard time of the lo locality and you are watching simultaneously at some other time frame but it is live you are watching every single action say uh, messi scores a goal and you are watching it from your home now look simultaneously two things are happening number one is that you are watching the match but you are also not watching the match how basically look simply try to understand it simply since you are in your ug i would not go into the uh, details i would just try to simplify it as much as possible for you for instance try to understand that you are watching a semblance of the match you are watching a simulation of the match but you are not in brazil you are not watching messi kick the actual goal you are watching an image of messi kick the goal if that helps you to understand you are watching a semblance you are watching a simulation of messi uh kicking the goal scoring the goal so basically what happens is that uh when you are watching this match it creates a sense of pleasure in you and when it creates that sense of pleasure it also sublimates your tension your repression that is at moments we are associating ourselves with messi maybe we are associating ourselves with cristiano ronaldo or whoever the other players are i am not too much into football in any case uh whoever the other players are so what is happening is that we are watching them and by watching them we are associating ourselves with them and you know we bengalis have a very interesting tendency next day we go to the tea stall and say eh, what did messi do he should have taken the goal from the left hand side from the corner maybe say take a 320 degree 
elliptical path and so on and so forth. That that is an old habit that we all of us have. But in any case, whatever is happening is that it is a form of sublimation. That is, it kind of allows us to channelize, to vent our own uh, understanding of the game. And it also allows us to vent our own repressed uh, existence through the game. All right. So therefore, nonsense literature becomes very interesting and it becomes very important. All right. Now, when we look at nonsense literature from the Indian perspective, all right. Uh, something interesting happens. That is the colonial discourse enters into the domain of nonsense. How does that happen? Basically, you see, uh, when we look at nonsense literature from the colonial perspective, now, imagine there is a colonizer country. For instance, let's take the communist example, the British. They came to our own land. So they colonized us. So they are called the colonizers and we are called the colonized. Now, it is generally believed that say uh, from 1857, from sorry, 1757, from the Battle of Plassey, they started ruling over us. That is our colonial period. But whatever happened with the beginning of colonization, that is called post-colonialism. So, basically the situation is called post-coloniality and whatever we utilize to interpret that situation is called post-colonialism. That is a theoretical framework. All right. So, basically, when we have uh, nonsense literature, as a post-colonial tool, the nonsense writers primarily started writing about their own situation, their own repressed colonial situation, colonized situation through nonsense literature. Now, how did this happen? You see, I'll talk a little bit about the colonial history first. Uh, Thomas Babington Macaulay, he wrote his minutes and that started, that kind of ushered the study of English literature uh, in the East, in India especially. All right. Now in Macaulay's minutes, Macaulay did something very interesting. This Macaulay realized that if we are to, if the British are to rule India, then they cannot simply rule it by Britishers. They need people from over here as well. Because it's a huge empire and it cannot be ruled by bringing people from there. It's a huge empire, huge population and therefore we need people from over here. But people from over here did not know English. So therefore, we need some people who can be taught English just to do the basic clerical work. So Macaulay in his minutes called forth for some educated clerks from Bengal because Bengal was the center back then. It was the capital back then. So this led to a class of educated, English educated Bengali Babus. Right. What is a Babu? Babu is what we call, uh, call the clerk in Bengali. Now this led to an upsurge of the Babu culture. These uh, Bengali quote-unquote Bhadralogs uh, engaged in English literature. They kind of created an amalgam. They created a hybrid race of Bengalis who were proud of their ancestry and equally proud of their newfound English lineage. So, 
at least intellectual lineage i would not say uh, proper lineage but intellectual lineage now these babus created a lot of problems for the british why you see in post colonial theory we have an author whose name is franz fanon now fanon suggests that what happens is that when we have such educated being uh, such educated natives who are educated in the foreign language in english especially what happens is that they start thinking that they are superior than their own fellow natives in a way for instance even today we often think that already right, this person cannot speak english properly he has a weird accent maybe and therefore he is not an educated man so we often consider english the capacity of speaking english fluently as a person's uh, parameter of education and back then it was the same so this new found babus with their new found english intellectual in, uh, lineage they thought they were superior than their fellow natives but they could not become a part of the master race because the british would not allow that now what happened is that these babus were dwindling between a superiority over the natives and an inferiority against the uh, master class the master race and that led to a kind of hybrid existence which fanon terms as black skin white mask that is they cannot change their skin color which is still black the color of the natives but they are wearing a white mask of the sahibs of the main sahibs of the educated um, uh, youth who are a part intellectually a part of the master class so that is called a black skin white mask now the black skin white masks they kind of were so very uh, adept with their own understanding of the natives as well as of the master class that they kind of became the bridge of a new renaissance in the literature in the culture in the arts of this part of the world and if you uh, google it you'll find very interesting tidbits about bengal renaissance which was a movement raja rammohan roy dirozio uh, david hair uh, then uh, kaliprasann singho all of them upendra kishor rai choudhury shukumar rai all of them are a part of the bengal renaissance it was a rebirth of culture literature renewed interest in different forms of new literature and you see this bengal renaissance while it gave us some very interesting genres that also gave us the bengali traditions of nonsense literature <clears throat> the bengali traditions the bengali equivalents the bengali variations of uh, what we might call a form of nonsense literature including the naksha the koutuk the chhora the potochitro these traditions came up with this bengal renaissance all right and uh, since i was talking about post colonialism and the colonial uh, impact on bengal rains on uh, india i would like to mention another bengal born woman <coughs> who is now an international phenomenon in her own right her name is gayatri chakraborty spivak now spivak wrote a very famous essay long long ago <coughs> which kind of changed our understanding of the post colonial situation the name of the essay is can the subaltern speak 
what is a subaltern? Basically, a subaltern is an infantryman. But in Spivak and in Gramsci's formulation, and Antonio Gramsci, uh, in his formulation and in Spivak's formulation, subaltern is anybody who is marginalized in any form or the other. The lesser fortunate, the marginalized, very simply put, they are the subalterns. All right. And now look in her essay, can the subaltern speak? Spivak mentions something very interesting. She says, no perspective critical of imperialism can turn the other into a self. Because the project of imperialism has always already historically refracted what might have been the absolutely other into a domesticated other that consolidates the imperialist self. I know it sounds very difficult, but do not worry. When I have taken the onus, I'll explain it to you. What does Vivek says? What does Spivak say? Let's try to break up her argument a bit. Spivak initially says, no perspective critical of imperialism, that is the colonial attitude. If you are trying to critique the colonial attitude, then no matter how critical you are, no matter how critical your perspective is, you cannot simply turn the other into a self. Is basically, you cannot simply associate yourself with a Britisher. The colonized cannot associate himself or herself with the colonizer master. You cannot. There is always a gap between the two. They are like the two elements of the binary. The colonizer and the colonized. They are the two elements of the binary. And basically, you cannot associate yourself with the colonizer master. Be why? Because... As Vivek says, the project of imperialism. So if she sees imperialism as a project. She says because the project of imperialism has always already. Now always already is a very Derridian formulation. We need not go into that too much. Uh, so the project of imperialism has always already historically refracted what might have been the absolutely other into a domesticated other that consolidates the imperialist self. Let's try to take an example. All right. Every year on 15th August, we forget what happened on 15th August. That is on 15th August, we gained our freedom from the British. But go to any Hindi movie channel, they will show you movies like Gadar. They will show you movies like uh, Border, LOC, so on and so forth. It's almost like we have culturally forgotten that we gained our freedom from the Britishers and not from Pakistan. Understood? Now look, basically when the Mughals came, and when the other Afghans, Pathans, everybody came, they either came, they looted and they went away. They did not care to rule us. Or they simply became a part of us. They become a part of our own culture, of our own civilization. Like say, Akbar, Humayun, Babur, Shah Jahan, Jahangir, everybody. They became a part of our culture. Interestingly, if you look at it, uh, they became a part of our food as well. You know, Kolkata is the only place perhaps in India where they serve the potato, the alu in biryani. Why? Because the Nawab who came to Kolkata, he was thrown away from his uh, kingdom by the Britishers and he did not have enough money to buy the meat for the biryani. So he supplanted the meat with alu. Potato, because potato can take the flavor of any spice. It is a very neutral flavor and a very sweet flavor, which kind of compensates for the lack of meat. So you see, they became not a part of our just culture. They also became a part of our cuisine, our clothing, everything. They became a part of us. 
but you see when we think of say bringing an architecture which was made maybe in the mughal leader maybe in the uh, afghan pathan era we never talk about breaking down say a british architecture say like victoria nobody would talk about breaking down victoria but everybody would talk about breaking down say maybe a uh, mughal architecture that is our way of getting back at them that is our way of getting back at history but actually we forget that it was the britishers who actually came to rule us they did not become a part of us now simply understand why does this happen this happens because of two things number one because of our white skin fetish and number two is because they have successfully historically refracted you know what is refraction put a coin in the in a cup look at it put some water on the cup and look at it you see that the coin has risen but actually the coin has not it's refraction basic class 7 8 physics now what happens with that refraction is that they have successfully thrown up the onus they have successfully divided us so much that now we are more concerned you see nobody is concerned how many uh, hindus or muslims were converted to christianity by the britishers by, by the british masters but we are concerned about how many people were uh, transformed from hindu to muslim and vice versa why because they have successfully strategically poisoned our minds against each other now it is for us decide whether we live in that post colonial hangover of being in that poison or getting rid of that but you see this refraction this is what successfully marks the 190 years of slavery that we have under the britishers now this is a very historical post colonial understanding of our history uh and therefore it is very important that you understand this now you'll see that shukumar rai and the likes of him are deliberately critiquing the british rule they are deliberately critiquing the british absolutist paradigm with their nonsense literature when shukumar rai writes shiv thakur er apan deshe 21 ayin chale so the 21 laws actually function in the country of lord shiva he does not mean by lord shiva lord shiva himself he means the master race so you see nonsense literature is anything but nonsense it is nonsense because we do not understand the sense at the first go so that is the thing and i think with this i'll conclude today's class and in the next class i would talk a little bit about shukumar rai i would talk a little bit more about nonsense literature and then perhaps if we have time then i would like to go into one of the poems out of the 10 poems that we have in our syllabus all right we would love to read all of them and let's see how much we can do in the given time that we have Let's see. I hope you have enjoyed this class, and uh, if you have enjoyed this class, then uh, I think you have had some questions, some issues. If you have had questions, you know where to reach out to me. You can say your question, uh, write down your questions in the comments, or you can simply put it on my Facebook page or on my WhatsApp. So hope to hear from you. and in the next class happy learning and stay safe in your homes let's pray that this pandemic gets over pretty soon and we can meet each other in person because uh, i am really missing you people and uh, our classroom and everything so let's hope to meet you very soon thank you everyone